So a little reminder of upcoming court dates and a little bit about um, the actual brain when dissecting uh, or exploring a brain after a murderer has died, whether they were a one-time murderer, mass, time, mass murderer, serial killer, and what they find may or may not surprise you. And that's the first time I've used a little hook, like I would in a newspaper article, to get you to read more. And also, uh, I know I've talked about this before, um, mode of murder, how you kill someone, um, talk a little bit about that too. I believe I've talked about that also in the past, but first of all, let's do some updates on court cases that cases that we're following. And first, of course, is Trezell and Jacqueline West. They are still clumped together, still charged with identical crimes. Their next court date is January 20th. So 18 days from now, charged with second degree murder, involuntary manslaughter, willful cruelty to a child, conspiracy to commit crime, and false reporting of an emergency. And you know, I'm wondering if the second degree murder applies to one child, Orin or Orson, and the involuntary manslaughter applies to the other child, or is this a way that they cover their bases um, so that they get a conviction one way or the other? Um, I'm curious about that, and we'll, we'll see. Um, but the second affidavit I, I didn't see much press about the second affidavit. I read it verbatim and then I did a a timeline chart based on the second affidavit and it kind of zeroed in on September 17th as the murder of, and for some reason they redacted all the names of, of the kids and the 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 person who removed something from the house, a lot of this, a lot of stuff was redacted. But so was one child um, murdered, but in the moment, you know, not as uh, it could go either way. One child was accidentally killed, and then the other child was who wasn't killed. Um, was murdered uh, because of the first child accidentally dying. I still believe we're still going to be shocked. There's still more to come. That second affidavit was definitely a shock to me. It introduced other people into the mix. Um, a, a, a teenager who was staying there because of disruptions in their home at the time in September at the home here in Cal City, and another person who the affidavit refers to as an unnamed person, um, who they the affidavit, according to whatever, wherever they got their information, points to that person do, committing the murder, committing a murder and removal of something uh, the following day, which I'm assuming was bodies. But yeah, that second affidavit was an absolute mind blower with the additional information. I, I read it verbatim, it's in here somewhere. Um, I'm anxious for, for this to go to trial. And I hope it's broadcast somewhere. I know there are, I believe um, Matt from AV News Crew um, will be there. And I, I, I don't, I think he's kind of based in Lancaster, but I hope there's some way that he can, that he'll be in the, in there, in Bakersfield. If I lived closer, I would definitely be there every day. Okay. Second on our list is, uh, Jose Laura, who was, um, 
arrested on first degree murder of our cold case out here in Cal City, Desiree Thompson. Um, she had been uh, missing for 10 years and her estranged husband was a person of interest for 10 years. And um, there really wasn't any other uh, person of interest at that time. And uh, I, I believe he's laid low. Cops have said, we know where he is, blah, blah, blah. But I, I don't know if that's true. Um, but he has laid, he's, he's laid low. And uh, Desiree Thompson's mom even said, I don't know this guy, this Jose Laura, never heard of him. Shocked by his arrest. And it's his, you know, his mouth was a running. And, um, you know, he talked about it and about the murder and uh, got him arrested. But whatever the case, however, but that's what happens, right? People talk. And this was a revenge murder and it wasn't even against her. You know, she was an innocent in all of this, Desiree. Young mom of four kids, uh, making a new start, getting out of an abusive relationship, um, as reports go. And this guy was evidently pissed off at being kicked out of a party that was going on. And Desiree's mom said she did. She wasn't at the party. She was, because there was an incident earlier in the day, and I've talked about all that, but he has court day coming up in Bakersfield as well on January 13th. So one week exactly before the Wests appear. Also appearing one week after the Wests. So it's like seven days. First there's Jose Laura, exactly seven days later the Wests, exactly seven days later. Uh, the Davenport brothers and Anton James. Those were the three that were arrested in connection with the killing of Renetta Martin and Rosamond. Um, I've talked about that. That's a separate video I did. I did a little bit of a deep dive into Renetta Martin um, in this situation and the three who are suspected. Two of these, uh, either Jacques Davenport or Deshaun, one of those two brothers is in a relationship with Ant Anton Antone James. Um, she's pregnant by one of the two brothers and she and the, the, uh, boyfriend were involved in this, but not to the degree that this, that the one brother, I think his Deshaun might be the primary, the one who was driving around with Renetta Dett in his car. Um, and then they burned the vehicle and they, her body was recovered burned, um, slightly, I believe, burned um, on the side of uh, Bacchus Road out here towards Rosamond. Um, and Deshaun has a list of charges. He's got a list. They're not related to this. They're all three charged with arson of property and murder first degree. Um, Jacques, Jacques Juan, like there's a recent charge that popped up on his he okay the original arrests and everything were in august of, of uh 2022 right so i haven't gone back and check I've checked in on once in december of 2022 um there's a warrant uh that was served i guess while he was in prison because none of them have have bail so jaquan uh, Davenport was also charged with battery by gassing and obstruction resisting executive officer. He, you know, he will be, they, I believe they'll address that in court on the 27th as well as way, way it looks. Battery by gassing. So that's like you put chloroform over somebody's face or is it gas lighting you know I don't know anyway that's how that reads and we'll be watching for them and of course another devastating 
murder of two children. They were teens or preteens, um, Natalie Brothwell and Maurice Taylor in Lancaster. Um, horrible, they killed the two older children, nearly decapitating them, and had their two younger children locked in the rooms without food for about five days with the dead sibling, dead siblings. Um, he was arrested immediately, Maurice Taylor, and then she was, she, she wasn't, this Natalie Brothwell wasn't, and she went to Utah to hang out with her family, who, who are Mormons, and um, they got her too, they, they arrested her. I think they arrested her in Arizona. I think she had some family there. Too, as well as Utah. That doesn't matter. Um, so their date is coming up on January the 11th, 2023, in the Antelope Valley Courthouse in Lancaster, which is way closer to me, and I'm contemplating attending these when I am sure that their murder trial um, is in progress. I am going to attend the the, the court date, the uh, hearing, the, the court proceedings, because it's not that far. I go further just to do laundry because there isn't anything out here. But um, so it's like a 40 minute drive from here, 45 to get to that courthouse. Okay, on to um, the on to let's discuss a little bit about what you'll find if you autopsy a brain of a murderer. Um, so I read this very, very interesting article that was put out. I was looking up whether or not they had taken Manson's brain and studied it. Um, but I don't think they did. And with Manson, uh, I'm not sure if you'd really find anything remarkable other than, you know, because he did do a lot of drugs and stuff like that, and he was into mind manipulation. So I'm not sure. He may have just had a behavioral um, disorder and combined with the types of drugs that they were doing, hallucinogenics um, and whatever else, I, you know, I don't know what all drugs I never really did a deep dive into me, into Charles Manson and I really never and his clan I ne never really wanted to. Um, but this one article was was from a a, a coroner I believe. And they said, um, you know, would you find anything? Would there would there be any? And this was before Charles Manson died. This uh, this interview took place with him, and and they asked him, you know, um, would you want to study his brain? And he said, yeah, but it probably doesn't look that much different than yours or mine. You know, anybody's murder, murder, uh, murderer brain. Um. So his his. And, and people were curious, you know, people in general are curious about Charles Manson's brain. Um, researchers, let's see who wrote this article. Rafi Letzer, Letzer, Live Science. Okay, so in his uh, article, Researchers don't expect to find anything that unusual behind the walls of Manson's skull. Um, and at that time, this was written, they didn't even know if his skull would be studied, his brain would be studied. Okay, Jens Fowell, F-O-E-L-L, -L, Jens Fowell, a neuropsychologist at Florida State University, an expert in the relationship between the brain and behavior, told Life Science 
that while he believes Manson's brain is worth studying, he doesn't expect any surprising results. Quote, there are two different things you might expect to find uh, in Manson's brain, Fowell said. One, the more obvious, is if there is some reason to believe there is some sort of brain damage a lesion or a tumor or something like that associated with violent behavior. And then the, the writer continues, it's not unheard of to find damage or disease in the brains of killers. In 1966, Charles Whitman, a student at the University of Texas, Austin, was suffering from depression. The sharpshooter and Marine veteran visited a school psychiatrist and complained of violent fantasies. That is one thing you kind of hear recurring in mass murderers and serial killers is the fantasy. I have kind of picked up on that in some of this stuff. Then just after midnight on August 1st of that year, he murdered his mother, washed his hands, and wrote a note expressing regret for his actions then he killed his wife, stabbing her five times. I love her dearly, he wrote, according to the Washington Post's account. I cannot rationally pinpoint any specific reason for doing this. The next morning, Whitman loaded a heap of weapons and ammunition into a push cart, took it by elevator to the top of the bell tower on the UT campus, and murdered 14 more people wounding an additional 30 over the course of a two-hour shooting spree before he was himself shot and killed. An autopsy revealed a tumor in Whitman's brain that was pressing on areas related to self-control. Though the question whether that caused his killing spree remains a matter of debate among scientists. Um, you may have heard 1966, we're talking Vietnam, this guy comes back um, and is a, is a student at this university. You may have heard about this. It was, they talk about it a lot when you hear about the 60s and you hear about Vietnam, you hear about this guy getting up on a bell tower and just shooting. Um, it was, it still is one of the, one of the shooter mass murder de uh, events that is widely talked about. Fowell said, uh, she's the, the scientist, that, that no particular reason to expect to find a similar defect in Manson's brain. However, not least because a brain tumor would likely have been detected, you know, because he's been in, in prison for over 40 years. The other possibility regarding Manson, Fowell said, is that you have a healthy brain that is different from other people's. And that difference increases the possibility that people commit crimes. And that's where the situation becomes more complex and more murky. When Fowell looks for the neural mechanisms that lie behind violent behaviors, he doesn't look at one violent criminal at a time. If there was a killer who attacked three people on a golf course using sharpened hockey sticks, Fowell said she wouldn't be able to pinpoint to a fold or nodule on that person's brain and say, aha, this made him need to kill with misplaced sports equipment. From the perspective of neuroscience, the really interesting data about a brain shape and size is aggregate. If lots and lots of serial killers' brains have some particular abnormal shape in common, that's much more useful data than any one abnormality in the brain of an especially heinous killer, according to Fowell. So I get that for sure. Um, yeah, definitely. Fowell can make some educated guesses about what Manson's brain might look like. For example, the uh, amyg amygdala, gosh, I draw on a blank there. The amygdala, a region of the brain involved in emotional control, would likely show signs of being a bit less active when it was alive. If you were to do a test with an alive Charles Manson, where you're showing pictures of people in pain 
or people in emotional situations in an MRI scanner, he said, I would expect his amygdala to react less strongly to that. Manson's dead brain would likely exhibit similar signs of an amygdala with far fewer connections to other parts of the brain than average. And Fowell thinks it's worth studying, at least as one more data point in the larger picture of murderous brains. But no matter what turns up, Fowell doubts it would shed any shocking new light on the 69 murders, those are Manson's murders. The physical structures of people's brains just don't vary enough to fully explain anyone's behavior. In a different environment and different context, the question is, would he still have done the same thing? This is this part really, really intrigues me. I would say it was probably just an unusual confluence of both Manson's personality and also the circumstances of the time. And even if a coroner did slice open Manson's skull and discover an atrophied amygdala with features seen in the brains of other murderers, neuroscientists couldn't be sure those wrinkles had been there back in 1969. One thing people forget is that everything you do changes your brain. Fole said, this conversation, if you remember it, you remember it because firing patterns change in your brain. One thing people forget is that everything you do changes your brain. This conversation, if you remember it, because you remember it because firing patterns change in your brain. Every nerve cell in the brain has an average of about 1,000 connections to its near and distant neighbors, Fowell said. And those connections strengthen or disappear with every new situation a person encounters. That means that whatever particular spark in Man Manson's brain grew to consume the lives of his followers, their victims, and the morbid curiosity of the nation has been lost to the decades in that dark moment in Los Angeles history. I found that the last couple paragraphs very wild. Everything you do changes your brain. Whoa. I have just changed my brain. Hmm, isn't that wild? found that to be so I, that that's what really pushed me to do this and I, I wanted to do the updates on the on the trials anyway now the something else I have talked about um, is a uh, mode of murder um, what's the difference does it mean anything different when you set yourself like I know with suicides um, that the manner of suicide is telling it it does um mean something so if you hang yourself if you set yourself on fire if you jump off a building if you slit your wrist if you overdose um shoot yourself like each mode of because this goes into behavior which is more studied than how behavior develops out of the brain you know, 
um, which I, I really, I kind of don't see how you can separate. I guess it's easier to study that way behavior. And that's where you get, you know, your DSM manuals and your, and your um, mental health disorders, as they call them. Um, and that's why when you go into a therapist or a psych, uh, pr probably not a psychiatrist so much, because all they want to do is put you in a box and give you pills. But with a therapist, um, they like to go into your history, not only to kind of see where you came from, but they also experiences at, at a young age can definitely affect your brain. So now when they, you see these articles and they're talking about the, how the brain is the same, whether you're a murderer or not, you might see a little, you know, something in the meaning that they don't have compassion or they don't, you know, they're, they're um, sociopathic or something like that, where they can, they don't have a normal emotional reaction to death and, and murder and stuff like that. But it, I personally believe it's connected. I haven't had any medical training. I have had some psychology, but nothing like this, nothing that makes me, um, you know, knowledgeable in mass murders and things like that, but just reading a lot. And when something like this comes up, you, you want to dig in and figure out like what was going on in that brain. Um, my opinion with this particular case of Koberger is that he, I believe he falls into that category where he was fantasizing about murders. And he, because he didn't initially go into study criminology and the brain of a serial killer, he was in something else, some like computer stuff, right? And so, I think maybe at an early age he was having, you know, you know, whether he created the images in his own mind or he dreamt about them, but, you know, murderous images, murderous thoughts. And the only thing I have to go by with that is, of course, it's rat. And this article also too in uh, Live Science about these murderous thoughts and, and how, like, how they, you know, um, progress sometimes into actual murder. But I think, my own opinion, he probably did have some murderous thoughts. I think he probably wanted to, to kill. The only similarity I kind of see with him and Ed Surratt is um, he was intelligent. They're both intelligent. And Koberger had a shift in somewhere, somehow along the way, he had a shift in behavior like Ed Surratt did, like smart, intelligent, you know, disappears for summer vacation, comes back, uh, noticed lots of uh, strange behavior. And um, the only thing is I don't think Koberger carried out any petty crimes or anything like that, like you hear about some other, you know, like Ed Surratt carried out some, some, some crimes and depending on where you go the crimes were this or they were that but um but you know you don't hear about ed surratt but there was a lot of study into ed surratt and his wife described how he you know he would come back from wherever he was and he would dive into church and he also was very irritable like he had I like to call it anal because it wasn't really OCD, but but he had a sharp trigger response to stuff. Like don't interrupt him, you know, if he's sitting reading or whatever, but, he, but his response to some of that stuff would be a way more aggressive, maybe not physically, but the way he would yell or the way that he would demand silence or something like that. Um, and it would be to him, I imagine it was a buildup over time. Like he would come back from, from some murders and then um, he would withdraw and then go to church and say he wanted to be a better person. And he thought the answers were in the Bible and, you know, would go to sometimes two services a day and on and on. And then over time, his wife said, 
um, he would, again would start to cloud over and I'm just paraphrasing and become more withdrawn and almost as if like if you could imagine it in a face how that face would go from a normal face like uh, maybe of concern or compassion and over time that face would turn into one of like extreme anger and then he would say he had to leave and he would just get up and go and I believe even Ed Surratt himself had said he had this urge he had those fantasies of killing and then he just had this urge and he's one of those serial killers that you don't hear much about but he didn't use just one weapon he would he he would um, do recon on the neighborhood pick the houses that were easy to get into one story so and you know check out the entrance ways exits ways and then he would bust in shoot the man with a shotgun that's why he got called the shotgun slayer because he used that in a lot of murders and then he would take the woman and force her out of the house and either do something with her uh, right outside the house or some women, a couple of women have never even been recovered. But then he would rape them and beat them with his fists, with a bat, with the butt of the gun, and then strangle them to death. And then just dump the body. Um, so he was a serial killer that used multiple means to murder and I, I think he's he's one of those serial serial killers who's still alive who has talked who has been studied um, and it's interesting because in prison regular uh, Christianity type church I guess wasn't doing it for him so he he uh, turned to I don't want to say Buddhism, um, but I I'm drawing a blank, but it's, it's a, it's a, a form of religion outside of, you know, traditional American Christianity. So definitely find that, you know, behavior, um, behaviorally it's not the same like how many hundreds of thousands of people grow up in abusive homes right in poverty um, some grow up with their parents in prison for murder for prison for um, any number of things and yeah they might be damaged but they continue on and, and have a life, they hold a job, they get married, they have children, whether they go to therapy or not, you know. Um, so there has to be a deeper connection into what environmental, um, uh, environmentally what happens to a person like this, this doctor said, you, your brain changes with everything, you know, with every conversation, with every experience, your brain will change so there but there has to be more than that to 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 actually turn a person into a murderer or i think there is a is a murderer born but this like this um the 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 professor that was um uh Koberger's professor in DeSalle university um, she said in a previous interview, not related to this case at all, but, but it was recent that they were beginning to find in neuroscience that there may be some physical connections in the brain. There may be some, something physical deep going on that is enough to make a person born with that, these, these, uh, you know, alterations of the brain, of the neuro, uh, neural um, workings of a brain that would, that would uh, show um, enough of a change in the brain that would 
explain a person who uh, would want to murder, who would have those obsessions to murder, who would have those murderous fantasies. So it's, it's going to be interesting to follow that, not necessarily Koberger. Like, I, I, I really don't even care what his motive was for, for murdering. Um, I think for law enforcement, for psychiatry, the study of the brain, for science, I think knowing all of that is important because it builds on the picture that they already have. It helps in profiling when things like this happen somewhere else. And the more they know about this guy and what made him in his own head go to this length. Uh, like Ed Surratt, he just had this urge, you know. He said, and who can believe him, but he said he grew up he loved his parents and his parents were great. He didn't have a, a, a rotten childhood or anything, but he sort of also wants to blame society. Uh, his last interview, he, he said he never killed black people, which, and he'll never admit to killing that young girl because she was black and um, you know, what else is similar, Ed Surratt and Manson, pimps, you know, they get to a large city and they, they start pimping girls out. Weird. But, but none of that, there's a lot of pimps, you know, not, that doesn't, because you're a pimp, that doesn't mean you're going to be a murderer, you know. So, I do believe that there's something in the brain, and maybe with technology, with the MRI, um, and perhaps uh, refining this physical study of the brain when people are alive. Um, there may, like, I think they're on the road to discovering what parts of the brain uh, may be born with that are more likely you're, you know, and then soon medication will follow because, you know, pharmaceutical people want to get rich. Okay, knife versus gun when it comes to killing someone, not a suicide. Um, largely what I gathered from this article that was written in, this is a, an older article, but it's, I don't think anything's changed. Um, it's a lot of times it's availability. Um, so are you a gun collector? Then you're going to, if you want to become a murderer, you're probably going to shoot somebody. Um, if you're a hunter you, and you have knives handy um, and you're used to using a knife to slice open deer and other things, then if you wanted to kill a human being, that's probably the way you'd go. Um, and then again, you know, I, I think that to a degree this was planned out. What Koberger did was definitely planned because of his fantasies or um, something of that nature, whatever it was um, in his particular brain that brought him to that point. But also, too, I, when I was looking up to Sal University for my last video, I watched a video on there's a there's a, a, a crime house on campus where they recreate crimes and they set the house up, you know, using blood and everything. I don't know if it's fake blood or whatever, but they set the house up as if murders have just happened. And I have a still picture on that last video of the knife in the blood and on the kitchen floor. Um, and that's, they, you know, I, I imagine that's very helpful because it feels like they're in a live crime scene and they go through the steps and they go through the process of uh, examining, you know, the scene. And I imagine for him, if he's having murderous fantasies and like that scientist said, everything changes the brain. So he was probably storing because of his own brain, storing all of this stuff, especially the recreations of, of murders and going in and examining it and stuff like that. Um, 
And yeah, the availability of a knife is definitely, uh, you know, knives are definitely more available these days instead of going through a process of getting a gun. And this article quoted, this is a 2014 article um, by Eric, my glasses, Eric Niller, N. Niller, for a seeker. And he quoted, a, he talked about this case where a high school student outside of Pittsburgh, a high school outside of Pittsburgh, where a 16 year old sophomore slashed 19 of his fellow students and an adult before being stopped by school officials. Um, why a knife? And so quoting, anytime somebody commits a murder or assault, either by choking, stabbing, or making bodily contact, it always speaks to a level of rage and perhaps a personal connection to the victim that shooting with a gun does not. said Naftali Burrell, Burrell, a forensic psychologist in New York City. So by choking, that's probably why with Ed Surratt they said um, when he shot the man, he was shooting his father, but when he raped the woman, that was re in reference to his mother, but you know, he contests that. Ed Surratt said, no, that's not true. When you are stabbing someone, it's close and in your face, which is what that other psychologist said, psycho the profiler said in my other video. The experience is more visceral and more graphic, more provocative. It speaks emotionally, emotionality. Everybody's using ality on the ends of things these days, whether rage or paranoia. Perhaps the student couldn't get a gun the weapon of choice for perpetrators of mass violence at schools, workplaces, malls, and even military installations. Or perhaps he was living out a fantasy. Here we go with the fantasy again. In some cultures, listen to this, attacking multiple strangers with a knife is part of a mental disorder or syndrome called amok, A-M-O-K, a term that originated in Indonesia according to James Clark, a psychologist in Rochester, New York. Amok is a disassociative episode that begins with brooding, followed by a period of violence or homicidal behavior directed at people and objects. According to a psychologist guidebook known as the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, dsm 4 it is initiated with a perceived slight or insult and usually happens among only among males. The original, so maybe the boy of the four was the target. The original reports of Amok came from Malaysia, Laos, Philippines, Papua New Guinea, Puerto Rico, and the Navajo. It's not a great leap to suspect that this occurs in American populations as well, Clark said, but it's probably more impulsive and limited by what's available. We all have kitchen knives at home. Other experts say that more important is the planning that went into the event rather than the choice of weapon. People who study violence put perpetrators in two categories, predatory or reactive, which is what that profiler said in my other video that this was predatory. The predatory aggressors are scarier. They are the ones that keep us up at night, says Kimberly Georgina's, Georgians, assistant professor of psychology at the University of Denver and a neuropsychologist in private practice. Uh, Georgians said that a major incident of random stabbing occurred recently in China. Who is to say that this China stabbing wasn't romanticized in this kid's mind to be a viable option for someone who couldn't put his hands on a gun? Or put him in a history book 
as someone who was interesting or notorious. Georgians Clark, Georgians Clark and other psychologists say that little research has been done in the differences in murders or criminals who use knives versus guns. People are going to be looking at what's available at the moment, Davis said. If someone had a choice between semi-automatic weapon and butcher knife, I'd like to ask them, why did you choose that? I would get a personal response related to the situation rather than something that describes the attitude of a perpetrator. So the choice of weapon is per situation. When it comes to murder, attacking with a knife can also involve more rage. And then it goes on to talk about this one we don't about types of guns in that you know in the United States and things like that. So I find all of that those are hurting my brain. So I find all of that to be very interesting and you can use that information uh in in every murder but there, there again ed surratt like did he have more rage towards women because he would just go in and kill the guy you know no there was no interaction or face to face up close nothing you just shoot him and then take the woman um ed surratt has said that it, it wasn't, uh, it, it, all of it was just something that was internal. And he usually did kill in, in multiples of two. You know, one murder instantaneous and the other dragged out. Um, but that isn't, you know, he also was convicted of molesting a 13-year-old boy which he never wants to talk about. So, but anyway, I found all of that to be a much more interesting thing to discuss than uh, Koberger, because I really, oh, there's that beautiful boy, that pretty cat. He's probably looking for, so he's gonna come around the back here and look for food. All right, so I'm gonna end here so I can go put some food out. <laughs>